So welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. And I know people will come in later on and we'll also have the playback available for people as well. So we can answer the questions, which is great. And basically, you know, um, today we're going to talk to Dr. Lisa Weeks. She's a naturopathic doctor. And we're going to learn all about healthy eating. So Lisa, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah, for sure. So uh, I'm a naturopathic doctor here in Toronto. I've been practicing for about 13 years. I come from a science background. So I used to have several different research jobs studying cancer, cystic fibrosis, etc. Um, but I found that I wanted to work with more natural therapies. Obviously, there's a time and a place for that. But I was really curious about how other cultures use health and healing and nutrition and herbs. So I lived in Korea for about a year. That was my year to decide what to do next, whether, you know, med school, teaching, whatever. Um, and there I saw the importance of food and herbs that was incorporated into their daily meals and lifestyle. So yeah. um, that reinforced that I wanted to come back and start the naturopathic program. And I've been working with patients ever since now virtually with the coronavirus pandemic. But I see a lot of people with digestive concerns, stress, skin rashes, weak immunity, and then hormonal imbalances, because I actually have a podcast called the perimenopausal mamas, um, M-A-M-A-S. Um, and we talk about raising kids as we're starting to notice hormone shifts. My co-host and I, Dr. Tony Reed, who's another naturopath. So my practice is shifting a bit to focus on hormonal imbalances and um, raising healthy kids as well as keeping ourselves healthy. So that's a little bit about me. Wow, that sounds like quite the resume. <laughs> that's <general. laughs> for sure. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> Absolutely. So, I mean, you know, we're all living sort of the quarantine, self-isolation lifestyle right now, if we can call that a lifestyle. But how would you suggest that we maintain good, healthy eating habits right now? Yeah, that's a really good question because so many people are, you know, going and getting comfort food, indulging in more alcohol, watching a lot of Netflix, and usually watching TV or movies is a time where people typically have that association of snacking and eating too. So it really starts off with having a plan, right? So planning what you're going to eat that week, shopping and getting those things, limiting getting those treats and those foods that call your name at night when you're watching TV. So maybe not buying them. Or if you buy them, put them far away, like in the basement pantry or the cold storage room if you have one. So it takes some extra steps to get there. So we really need to plan ahead so that we don't have to rely on our willpower every single second, right? Because if you're working at the kitchen table, those cookies, those chips are going to be calling your name every break. And um, <laughs> it's really easy to just say, ah, screw it, you know, but so planning ahead and then really setting up kind of a healthy day what that looks for you so a schedule because a lot of people are off schedule they're working different hours or they're not working like they used to um, but still having your regular set times when you're eating your meals is really important so mm -hmm. saying I'm gonna have breakfast every day at 7 or 8 a.m whatever that looks like okay I'm gonna have lunch at 12 or 1 having the same dinner time and then really just setting up in your mind these meals should be nice and full and complete with protein, healthy fat. You can listen to Jane's episode, Jane Jerspulke. She covered a lot of ways to have balanced meals to keep you full. Um, but if your meal is keeping you full for four or five hours, that's a good sign because really we shouldn't be snacking. Once we start snacking, it can be really hard to stop, especially because it's typically unhealthy foods and they have that perfect ratio of salt, sugar, and fat. If you've seen, you know, the special on Netflix, they know how to engineer the food so that we are addicted and we can't stop. So that's the ideal, right? Is having that foundational plan for your meals right. and when you're eating, avoiding the snacks or limiting them. If you are going to have a snack, really taking out a serving size, take it a serving size from the bag, you know, put it on a small plate. Don't bring the bag of chips. Don't bring the crackers over to your desk but really count out how much you're going to have and try to eat it mindfully. So you're savoring it. Um, you allow those hormones that tell you you are full to be released because it's so easy to just shove food in while you're working. And next thing you know, oh my gosh, that whole box of cookies or crackers is gone. So really the planning is, is the first um, foundational piece for that. That's amazing, Lisa. I think uh, that's some really good advice. I feel like you've obviously dealt with this issue before based on what your response totally. was. 
<laughs> well, even um, for myself too, right? Like I think, you know, we all go through times where, you know, we would snack a lot or when I was studying as a naturopathic student, like you needed right. fuel, but sometimes it was the wrong one. So um, I think right. these strategies can help. Absolutely. That's great. So what kinds of foods do you think we should be having? What should we be eating? Yeah, that's a good question. So there are some limitations right now in terms of, you know, what you can get, you can do delivery or pickup. And some people are still going shopping and being very careful, but supplies, they're not as bad as the first, you know, week or two of when uh, things were really shut down. But it's, it's, it can be a little bit difficult. So you really want to get nutrient dense foods. So foods that actually have real ingredients in them. Ideally, they're not even in a package, right? So we always talk about shopping the perimeter of the grocery store store, getting your produce, getting your healthy sources of protein, you know, if there is an ingredient in there, maybe it's oats or oatmeal, it's one ingredient, right? So making sure you recognize what is inside it. And then you really want to have foods that are going to support your immune system during this time, right? So some of my favorites and that you can kind of sip on throughout the day too. One thing is bone broth right? So it could be chicken oh. bone broth, you can make it, you can buy it now organic in those Tetra packs, but it's really oh. high in electrolytes. It has what's oh. called glutamine in there, um, and N-acetylcysteine. So these are things that can have good immune support effects. N-acetylcysteine may have some antiviral effects. Again, nothing's been proven for coronavirus at this point in vivo and in, in humans, but we want to strengthen our gut and our immune system as much as possible. And the bone broth glutamine also heals the intestinal cells. So that's kind of good. Some people even have that just sipping on a mug or two throughout the day. You can warm it up. Um, you can even add a little bit of spices to it if you want, like a little bit of turmeric in there. Um, and that can be really good for hydration and immunity. And then you really want to focus on good sources of protein to start. So, you know, chicken, healthy sources of fish. Um, you could do grass fed beef if you can tolerate beef or you're okay with that. And then really getting in a lot of veggies and some healthy fats. So veggies, you know, some you might not be shopping as often. So a lot of things are wilting, like we bought too many greens and they were starting to go bad too quickly because and I think they weren't that great of a shape when we first got them, but we're eating a lot of cabbage, so making a lot of coleslaws, eating a lot of squash. We've just bought a lot of kale because that's pretty hearty, right? And it doesn't wilt as quickly. Um, getting in, yeah, like broccoli and cauliflower. Right. We even buy a whole bunch of frozen organic veggies and then stock our freezer up with that. So we have nourishing vegetables to eat you know, between shops as well. And then the healthy fats, I know Jane talked about too, but you can snack on some nuts or seeds, again, size out a certain portion amount so that you're not going to eat the whole bag, avocado, olive oil. I don't know if you've ever tried coconut manna. This is one of my favorite sources. Coconut of manna? Coconut manna, otherwise known as coconut butter. If you haven't tried it, I recommend if you can get it online, it's actually like the meat of the coconut with a bit of oil in it and oh. it actually hardens up and it's almost like sweet it is sweet itself there's no sugar and it actually tastes kind of like a shortbread so you just can like sprinkle it on some chopped fruit so coconut so oil is good too but it's different coconut yeah it's oil. actually yeah coconut oil does harden too at um when you know in, when it gets cold or at room temperature right. in the winter but the coconut man is a mix of the meat and the oil it comes in a jar and mm -hmm. you actually have to put it in hot water first to mix it together but then you can crumble it on fruit you can add it to if you're having any sort of yogurt I like coconut yogurt um, but that's so tasty it has a natural sweetness and it's going to keep you full too so oh, you really want to yeah get in those healthy fats because that's going to keep you satiated as long as I well like as that protein protein yeah so one of the things you just talked about was bone broth and it's funny so i'll go to there's this restaurant called impact kitchen and i always see that they've got bone broth on their counter and i sort of really never thought about that now is that just basically like chicken chicken stock is that what that is so yeah, it's actually cooked a lot longer. So if you get bones, so it could be from, you know, chicken, you could get bones from other animals. If you're using, if you're doing it in an instant pot, it only takes like two hours. But if yeah. someone's doing it on the stove or in a slow cooker, they may do it 24, 48 hours. So it leaches out 
all of the good nutrients from the bones and they usually add in some of the cartilaginous tissue as well i typically right. add in a bit of apple cider vinegar like a tablespoon or two i add in yep. filtered water the bones that's the very basic way to do it i cook it in the instant pot for two hours um, and you can even add in celery root chopped celery onion carrots bay leaf if you want to give it a bit more flavor so it's like soup on steroids if you will so yeah soup is great but you get even more nutrients leached out of the bones and the cartilage because it's cooked interesting so long. we've got a question coming in on the chat and sure. uh, the the person wants to find out can you comment on the dietitians of canada statement you cannot boost your immune system through diet i think that probably it's yeah it's, you had just said with your own organization mm -hmm. i think well, giving people advice about COVID, I guess is I'm assuming what that is, but maybe yeah, about that. So we thrive on vitamins, minerals, and nutrients, right? We need the right foods, amino acids from our protein to be strong, to grow, to have balanced hormones. Um, so if we're looking at, you know, in the naturopathic perspective, and I think other um, professions, we do look at nutrition as a foundational piece to health. Yes, we may not know specifically how it is preventing COVID or Corona, COVID-19, um, but we can work on what we're called. So we look at the germ as the virus, right? And then we're the host. So the germ, we're trying to not expose ourselves to the virus as much as possible. That's the best prevention, right? Like that's the best way of not getting it. But let's say we are exposed to the virus. We do have some control over the state of our body. We're called the host, right? So we call it terrain as well. So it's how I'm sleeping. It's how I'm eating. It's my vitamin D status. It's my stress levels. So if I'm not sleeping as well, if I'm deficient in vitamin D, then I'm more susceptible to get certain illnesses. Again, we don't know specifically for coronavirus, but this has been shown for like flu and colds. For example, if people have low vitamin D levels, they're more likely to get respiratory tract infections too. So it does impact our susceptibility in terms of potentially the severity and the duration of the illness. So I can't comment on where they're coming from, but from my perspective, what we do and what we put in our mouth is foundational for our health and for our immune system. Granted, maybe some viruses can override that, like maybe, you know, people that are eating super, like, super great and they're dealing with stress and they're sleeping well, but there may be some genetic components that make people weaker to susceptible viruses. But right. we can do as much as we can just to strengthen ourselves, even against other viruses, bacteria, etc. Interesting. Great. That's good. So, you know, you talked a little bit about snacking. And so, you know, there's this concept, I guess, sort of in the diet world, I guess we'll call it diet world, that you could have a cheat meal or a cheat day or something like that. What are your thoughts about that sort of concept? Yeah, so I guess I guess I don't really want people to feel deprived or restricted, right? Like I want them to feel like they're enjoying their food on a fairly regular basis. And again, me enjoying food versus somebody else can be quite different, right? Because your taste buds can change too. So you want to, you know, you don't want to be eating the Big Mac every day. And yes, I'm enjoying my food. But you're, you want to be eating a healthy foundational diet, but have things that you like to eat too inside of that. So the cheat meal, yeah, maybe once a week, you'll have have like okay let's say I'm not having any pizza or I'm not having any desserts okay maybe I'll have like a dessert that week or some pizza I don't need anything really with gluten but I'm just giving an example <laughs> um, so I think like there's nothing wrong with that right like everything in moderation too but I just don't want people to be like feeling deprived on a daily basis because then that can be a sign it's probably not something you're gonna stick with and then there are some people when they do have that cheat meal sometimes they're just like ah that just wrecked everything screw this I'm going back to how I was eating before so some people might look at it as you know they've messed up why continue other people might do it and then right, get right back to their healthy habits again so right it all depends but hopefully you're enjoying healthy food because you know I used to be a sweet tooth person and now I really enjoy the sweetness of that coconut mana for example or right. root vegetables taste sweet to me so my taste buds have changed over time that's a good point I see that we've got another question in the chat so okay. it would be practicing intermittent fasting at this time? And if so, how many days per week would you recommend of intermittent fasting? 
Yeah. So I'll preface this with I'm not an expert in fasting by any means. I do feel that people do well with time restricted eating. So at least going a 12 hour period overnight from when you have dinner to when you have breakfast. So let's say you have dinner at seven, you won't have breakfast till seven or later. Some people do well with going 16 hours. So that would be considered intermittent fasting without eating and then eating within a eight hour window. Some people feel they do better if they eat between, you know, 10 and 6, or some people feel better between 12 and 8. Mm -hmm. um, but you just want to make sure it feels right for your body, right? Because like fasting and skipping meals for some people, they can get hypoglycemic. So then they can release cortisol. And right now, cortisol, the stress hormone is being amplified for so many reasons, right? You watch the news, you're worried about your job, you're looking after your kids. So we just want to be careful that it's the right thing for you. So if you're eating enough outside of that fasting window and your blood sugars are stable, you have good insulin response in your body, then you may feel really good doing that. But it's good to talk to somebody and you almost can start to expand that time window of fasting slowly. It doesn't have to be like, okay, one day I'm, you know, eating every few hours and right when I wake up um, to the next day, okay, I'm doing a 16, eight or just eating eight hours in the day, you might be like, let me try a 12 hour overnight fast for a few days. And let me try a 14 hour and just see how your body responds to that. And then in terms of the number of days a week, yeah, I can't really comment on that either. Because some females need I can comment, but uh, some females need to eat more before their periods. So but as you're building up your lining in your uterus, sometimes you need more nutrients, you're more hungry too. So it could look different, you know, the first half of your cycle if you're menstruating. So from when you get your period to ovulation versus from when you ovulate to get your next period. But you can almost experiment with that too. Some people do the intermittent fasting, eating that eight hour window every single day and that feels good for them. So it is individualized. Interesting. Very interesting. It's and I guess it's I guess it's good that we're all individuals. So, um, you know, one slice just doesn't fit everybody really. Totally, totally. Yeah, it would be so much easier if one size fit all, but <laughs> that's not the case. <laughs> it really doesn't. So talk to us about leftovers, um, because yeah. obviously we're cooking at home a little bit more. You know, I know I'm carrying leftovers for a few days. You know, talk to us about, I guess, what's healthy, how, how we cook them, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when people think uh, or when they have leftovers, they're always wondering how long should I keep them? Is the nutrient quality going down? Um, for us, yeah, we typically make enough food to last for two meals. And if we don't eat it the next day, or even we sometimes do this like the third day after, if we don't eat it within that window, we freeze it so that the nutrient status stays really high. Um, another concern with leftovers is that when you leave it in the fridge, especially like leftover meats and things, then bacteria act on it and then that can produce histamine. So over time, your leftovers can get higher histamine levels. So it's almost like an allergic response. Um, so they can have not only like allergy type symptoms, but migraines have been linked to high histamine fatigue, dizziness, for example. Um, so some people might get like have a sensitivity to that. So they might need to freeze their food right away if they've made enough for leftovers. And then when they defrost it, they eat it as soon as they defrost it. But if you're eating it the next day, probably not an issue, but you can listen to your body and see, okay, do I think there's these higher histamine levels, but you just want to make sure you store your food properly. You don't want, you know, the bacteria count to go really high. So, you know, let it cool down on the counter and then put it in the fridge right away and try to consume it within you know, two or three days. Um, but I think leftovers are great right now. People are stretched to the limit or if, even if you're living, if people are living on their own, then it's hard to cook something every night. So just making a batch, either freezing it or eating it over the next two days should be fine. And if you're keeping it in the fridge, how long should you keep meat that's left over in the fridge mm -hmm. before you decide you can't eat it anymore? It's not healthy for you. Yeah, I would say two or three days. Depends on the meat, too. So, and you can usually, like, look at it and see if the color has changed or if it has a weird smell. But usually two to three days is a good guideline. But you could freeze it before then and then have it, you know, the next week or even a month later. So that should be right. fine. 
And what about the microwave? How would you suggest we reheat our leftovers? Right. So I, I, I know in an ideal world, we would not have a microwave, but I have a three-year-old. We use it. I know it may reduce the quality of the food. We probably don't know enough about the long-term um, effects. We do try to heat up on the stove as much as possible, but we still defrost things in the microwave, not in plastic, obviously. So if it's a matter of like convenience, I try not to use it every day, right? So right. if you can use a little mini oven to heat up food, heat it up on a cast iron pan on your stove is really good but realistically for a lot of people they're not going to be able to do that every single time so if you're right. limiting it then and with bone broth I really try to heat it up for example on the stove because it is so nutrient dense too and I've already gone to all that effort to make it in the instant pot so you can kind of pick and choose your battles there but definitely don't buy the like you know, lean cuisine or things in plastic that you heat in the microwave because, you know, for so many reasons, <laughs> there's so many bad things about that with the bisphenol A and then the quality of the food too. But I love Jane's, Jane's episode was great, how she talked about store your like treats in there or your yeah. snacks that, so they're hidden from you or your family. Um, and she yeah. talked about putting her wallet in there when she was, you know, in a hotel room with it. So <laughs> that's how she uses it. That's amazing. <laughs> But I have to admit, yeah. we do use it sometimes. <laughs> that's funny. No, that's good. You're, it's, you're real. You're human, right? Which is all good. Can you tell us, uh, I think you mentioned something about Gretchen Rubin's Four Tendencies. What is that? Yeah, so she has like a framework to look at how do people respond to outer and inner expectations. So outer expectations would be from your boss or your partner or your friend. Inner expectations would be what you want to get done or, you know, what you need to get done yourself. So there's four different tendencies and it's good to know which one is your dominant one because then this can, you can navigate that tendency so that your healthy habits are likely to stick. So the four tendencies are, so Gretchen Rubin, sorry, I'll just backtrack a bit. She wrote, she's written a few books, Better Than Before, The Happiness Pro Project, and then The Four Tendencies. So she's always looking at how to be healthier and happier and have really good foundational habits in your life. Um, so she came up with this framework and the four tendencies. So the first one is what's called an upholder. So this is someone who meets inner and outer expectations. So if they say they're going to do it, they're going to do it. If they tell themselves they're going to do their workout and go to the gym, they're going to do it. They don't need anyone else to be accountable to. Um, they follow through. But those people can burn out too because sometimes they just take on so many expectations from themselves and other people. So that's right. the um, upholder. The obliger is someone who meets external expectations. So that's the person, but not their internal. So they're like, I want to go to the gym. But if they just say it, they're not going to do it. They need to sign up with a personal trainer. They need to meet their friend at, at the gym. Um, so they have to have a strategy to be accountable uh, to somebody else. So that mm -hmm. would be the um, obliger. There is what's called a questioner. So they can stick to like internal or follow through on internal expectations, but they need to have all the answers first. So these are the people in the meeting that are like asking a million questions. You're like, come on, why do you need to know all this? But they need to have all the information before they can take action. So these are the people that will research for hours, you know, the best exercise equipment before they buy it. So they'll still take some action, but it just takes some time. And then there's the rebel. If, they, if someone tells them to do something, they're like, screw that, I'm not doing it. Or, you know, if they have an expectation they think they should fulfill, they probably don't want to do it because they just don't want to be accountable to themselves or anybody else. So this can be a more tricky personality type to deal with. Um, right. But for you, so you want to recognize where you're at. So Gretchen Rubin has a quiz on her website, the Four Tendencies website. So you can see which one is your dominant tendency and you can overlap with a few of the others but then there's strategies on how to navigate that so you can stick to your healthy habits so if you're a snacker at night maybe you need to check in with your friend every night at the time you'd normally reach for the bag of chips in front of the tv and say i'm not taking those chips i'm just sitting here i'm having a cup of tea you know being accountable that way so it can really be used to help foster healthy habits with eating too right Interesting. Very interesting. And can you talk to us a little bit about guess, hormones and how that's affected in our foods and when we eat and things like that? 
For sure. So we have like hormones that really govern our metabolism and our weight. We used to think weight was governed by calories in versus calories out. You eat less and you exercise more and you're going to lose weight. But that's totally not true. It's where are the calories coming from? Because different foods can impact, for example, insulin, which is the fat storing horm hormone. So if you're eating a lot of carbohydrates or just like a cereal for breakfast without much protein or fat, you're going to release insulin and that's going to tell your body to store fat. And then you're also going to crash because your blood sugar is going to go up from carbohydrates because carbohydrates are chains of sugar. And then the blood sugars are going to go down. And that increases the release of cortisol, the stress hormone. And then cortisol also is a fat storing hormone, especially in the midsection. Because if you're releasing cortisol, your body basically thinks it's running away from a bear. So it's like, okay, digestion's not a priority. I got to store whatever you know meat I have because who knows how long I'm running from this bear. So your body's not in a state to build, repair, or to lose weight too. So insulin, cortisol are really key. So right now, a lot of people are having a lot more alcohol and sugar. So that's going to increase their insulin and their fat storage. If they're not exercising, we need exercise to make insulin work better, which insulin takes sugar out of our bloodstream. So that's going to impact the weight gain as well. Um, and then cortisol, so it's being released because we're bombarded with all this stressful information, right? We're trying to process what's going on. Everything looks like, you know, it's getting worse and worse and things are being extended. So we need ways to reduce cortisol through the right exercise for ourselves, through meditation, through getting in nature, obviously with social distancing, <laughs> right. breathing. Yeah, so we want to be, you know, safe with all of these actions, but that's really going to support weight loss. And, and sleep is really key for cortisol balance too, because if you don't get enough sleep, you release more cortisol the next day, even if you weren't presented with a stressful situation. So if people have a hard time losing weight, one of the simplest things they can do is get eight hours sleep because it's going to balance your cortisol and then you're going to release less of what's called a ghrelin hormone it's like the gremlin hormone that makes you feel mm -hmm. hungry the next day so if you get less sleep you're going to release more ghrelin the gremlin hormone and you're going to eat more the next day too so those are that's kind of the hormones in a nutshell we could talk about you know testosterone and thyroid but we'll see if anyone has any questions around <laughs> those because <laughs> i could talk forever so <laughs> yeah so i mean it's, it's interesting with the whole sleeping and how your weight. So, I mean, I guess, um, let, okay, so let's say you're sleeping six hours and, you know, that's clearly probably not enough sleep. So the next day you're sleeping a lot more because you're eating. Oh, actually, you know, before I get to that question, I see another question. So I'm going to um, chime in with this question. So the question was, should we peel fruit, or eat it with the skin? So if it's, so yeah, that's a good question. So if it's organic, I think eating the skin, obviously depending on what the fruit is, you know, not a watermelon or something, but you can get a lot of the nutrients in the skin too. If it's not organic, it's going to have pesticide residues. So you can't wash pesticides off with water. Pesticides are organ organophilic or hydrophobic. So they're scared of water. They love anything like organic chemical wise. So you can't wash it off with water. You need to use like a vinegar solution potassium iodine in water to wash off some of the pesticides. The pesticides still can get into the fruit too or the produce as well. Um, so if it's non-organic, you really want to wash it with vinegar or one of those nature veggie washes, um, the vinegar water wash together. Um, and then you it's up to you if you want to peel it, but some people will even get a reaction from the pesticides like apple skins. They'll feel their lips yeah. tingle if it's non-organic, but there can be a wow. lot of nutrients in the skin, but depends on organic versus not. And now what about washing your fruit with soap um, prior to eating it? Because right now we're saying a lot of the, you know, go to your groceries, wash everything with soap and water, then put it away. Mm -hmm. What's about that? So I guess it depends on the type of soap too, right? Like I, I understand we need to be very careful and wash and use anti, you know, or hand sanitizers. We also want to be careful with like antibacterial products, right? Because we can actually disrupt our gut microbiome from using it too much when it's unnecessary. And then that can weaken our immune system in the long term because 70% of our immune system is found in our gut and the bacteria that are lining our gut really govern how our immune system reacts to different things. So depending on the type of soap, 
so like the soap itself will be organophilic so it can wash off pesticides and residues so from that perspective you can get rid of some of the pesticides um, and I guess they're looking at you know disrupting that soap actually can disrupt the um, outer membrane of the coronavirus too but I would use a more natural kind of soap like nature's clean for example so you're still getting like that soap property but without any specific like antibacterial components to it so. that's good to know because i've been washing my fruit with dish soap okay <laughs> so i'll stop doing that now so. right and you might be fine you might have a, a strong gut microbiome but you know just to be on the safe side okay. so yeah like the nature's clean is a really gentle soap that you can use so okay yeah. that's good yeah. we've got another question and um and it's funny back to the sleep is what are some of the key tips to get into sleep mode and help relax? Mm -hmm. So sleep actually starts with the first thing in the morning, what you do, right? So ideally you're seeing sunlight within the first hour of waking. It's getting easier now because the sun's coming up. The sun actually tells our body to stop that cortisol or sorry, stop the melatonin production. That's our sleep hormone. And it gets us to release some cortisol, which we need the right amount at the right time to feel good. So we need to get out and have that sunlight exposure to shut down melatonin, start the natural cortisol cycle. And then we we also need to find a way to unwind a lot of us are going from a hundred and expect to go right to zero by the time our head hits the pillow and we're exposed to screens and media and multitasking so not only does the blue light from screens in your phone inhibit melatonin production the sleep hormone so you want to limit screens wear blue blocker glasses um, but you also want to have a way to unwind so if you are watching TV I do watch some TV before bed but I watch like those really bad brainless cheesy TV shows because I need my brain to turn off and I have the blue blocker glasses There's there's ones that you can actually put over your actual glasses too. So I'll watch a little bit of TV before bed. My poor husband, Pete, he loves like all of the, you know, cerebral TV shows and kind of thrillers and things, but he'll put up with like a little bit of, you know, say yes to the Dress America or whatever it is that I'm watching. <laughs> And then I go to bed earlier so he can watch his shows after. But I do that. And then I also do a meditation as well. So I'll go up into my room. I write read for a little bit. And then I'll do a guided meditation. Yes, it's on my phone, but I still wear the blue blocker glasses while I'm lying in bed. So I can turn off the phone after and then go to sleep. And sometimes I'll need to journal a little bit just to unload the thoughts from the day. But it's really about, yeah, how are you starting your day? And then what does your unwinding routine look like? And then obviously we could talk about caffeine and, you know, alcohol and when you're eating that can impact your sleep quality. Well, I mean, we should talk about those things. So for example, if you're trying to get a good night's sleep, I guess, what time should you be, I guess, how many hours before should you stop eating or stop drinking or all those kinds of things? Yeah, usually we say about two hours. So that's for several reasons. So not only then you're not going to have lots of heavy food in your digestive system and your body's trying to process it while you're sleeping. But when you're digesting, you're actually increasing your body temperature and you need your body temperature to drop like half a degree, a degree before bed so that you're able to secrete that melatonin. So you also want to lower the thermostat. You want to maybe sleep naked or in something light with not too heavy of a cover, but definitely a two hour window. And if you're having alcohol, definitely have it with food. If you have it on an empty stomach, it's going to have a greater blood sugar effect. So I think a lot of people find when they drink alcohol, they fall asleep, no problem, but they could wake up 3 or 4 a.m. And that's because your blood sugar is actually dipping at that point. So your blood sugar goes up with alcohol, alcohol sugar too. And then your blood sugar can dip at 3 a.m. and that triggers the release of cortisol. So you can feel wide awake and you're like, what's happening? This is 3 or 4 in the morning. Why is this? Why do I feel like this? So obviously, like, so if you can have your alcohol with food, that effect on the blood sugar is significantly less. And then I don't know about you, but you know, I love red wine, but if I have it, I feel like my body temperature is so much higher those nights and I start to get some more night sweats too. So some people can have sensitivities to different types of alcohol. For me, it's red wine. I'm typically okay with like unoaked white wines, but um, you can get a sense of which ones are okay for you and which ones could make your sleep worse. Interesting. So let's go back to alcohol for a second. Sure. One of the things I thought was interesting is you said it's better if you have alcohol with food, right? So you have that with dinner. So then do I take that same idea and think, 
it's better for me to, if I'm going to drink at night, to keep snacking on nuts or something like that. So it's better with food. Right. <laughs> the way you meant it, but. Okay. Like, I, I guess. I'm trying to justify drinking. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, I guess if you had a good foundational dinner, you might be able to get away with a bit without eating. But yeah, if you're putting the food and the alcohol in, then your body temperature is not going to get as low and you're going to have a lot in your digestive system. So when you go to bed, it might feel heavy. So it's like, yeah, what's worse? I don't know. So. <laughs> I guess in moderation, right? Some small right. little snacks and yeah, savoring those glasses of wine is okay. Okay, so you're actually allowing the snacks while you're <laughs> eating that. And they be more like protein snacks like nuts versus chips or sugar? Yeah, definitely. So protein snacks as opposed to like salty or sweet, definitely. So more nutrient dense foods. So at least you're replacing some of the nutrients that your body may need. You know, the alcohol has a diuretic effect too. And yeah, it's going to cause your blood sugar levels to crash. So in a perfect world, no eating or drinking two hours before bed. I guess if you're having some alcohol, like within that window, you could snack on yeah, some nuts, uh, seeds, maybe some olives. So that would be a good Ooh, option. Yeah. I'm <laughs> loving this right now this is great okay <laughs> i'm sure that wasn't your end goal is to give us ways to consume alcohol I <laughs> <laughs> well during this time honestly like it is a different game right now it's a different ballpark so it's like you know we're, we're not really focusing on restricting as much it's about reducing and in moderation right like right now i don't know if anyone's like i'm gonna do a cleanse i'm not gonna have any alcohol some people might great for them but it's like how can we have the least negative effects on your body from what you're doing. <laughs> right, that makes sense. Damage so control, yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. So we've got another question. Is it okay to put MCT oil, so coconut oil, inside your coffee? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, so MCT oil, our body treats it differently than other fats. So we actually use it for energy pretty quickly. And um, coconut oil in general has some immune boosting properties to it as well. So for general immune support, obviously not specific for COVID-19 that we know, but MCT oil can help you keep fuller longer. Some people will even add in a tablespoon of collagen powder into their coffee. So let's say they're doing intermittent fasting. They might have a coffee or a tea with half a tablespoon, a tablespoon, of the MCT oil from coconut and they might add in a tablespoon of collagen powder too so they're getting a bit of protein a bit of fat so that's almost like their snack or their breakfast if you will um, mm -hmm. and it may help yeah just to keep them fuller longer and they can go to lunch without eating anything specifically interesting so I mean one of the things you just mentioned some of the benefits of coconut oil so for example if I'm cooking an egg for breakfast for example um, and I had to choose between cooking that with coconut oil, grapeseed oil, olive oil, vegetable oil. What would be your choice? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say coconut oil would be the best option. So it does have a bit better of a, like a smoke, like a lower smoke point. So it's a bit more stable. Olive oil still can be a bit sensitive to high heat. So if you're cooking it on like medium heat, you should be fine. Um, but olive oil, yeah, coconut oil, number one right now, olive oil, number two, it's still great. It's still up there and use generous amounts of olive oil on your salads and cooked veggies. You can just, you know, pour it on for a little bit of extra fat too. And some people are even just eating a tablespoon of coconut oil. So right. you can do that if you're, if you're comfortable or put it in your smoothie too. And where does grapeseed oil fall with that? So coconut so, oil, grapeseed oil. Yeah, so grapeseed oil is pretty resistant to heat, but it has more of those omega-6s. So plant oils and grapeseed oils, omega-6, if we get too much of it, it's more inflammatory. We don't typically get enough of the omega-3, especially from like fish and seafood, for example, because we don't eat it every day. Probably a good thing because of all the heavy metals and toxins. You know, it's good to take a good quality omega-3, but the ratio of omega-6 to 3 in our diet has changed over the years. We used to get way less omega-6 and a lot more omega-3, and now we're getting way more omega what did I say? We used to get way more omega-3 and a lot less omega-6. And now we're getting a lot more omega-6 and way less omega-3 just from the food we buy. There's so many vegetable oils and different things. Restaurants are using canola oil or different processed uh, oils. So um, we want to reduce that as much as possible. But yes, it's more heat stable, but it can be more inflammatory in the body. You get interesting. More and, pains and, yeah. and what about Manuka honey? What are your thoughts on Manuka honey? 
Manuka honey is amazing. So it's from New Zealand and it's a special type of honey that has antimicrobial properties. And they actually have a whole line called Meta Honey that they use at different hospitals, for example, Sunnybrook, where they use it if people have like MRSA, like the staph resistant infection on the skin, if they've had burns and they need the, the honey has actually really good healing properties. Um, so it has great antimicrobial properties. So you can take it internally too, the actual Manuka honey. Uh, make sure it's 100% Manuka honey because sometimes they mix it with regular honey and they're like, oh, it's Manuka honey. Um, and there's only a little bit of it in there, but it can be really good to have those antimicrobial effects um, and really high in nutrients as well and good for the skin topically too. So Awesome. And um, we've got another question here about vegan protein. What and it uh, is the question is what type of vegan protein do you recommend? Yeah, I like people to have a variety. It's good to always switch up your type of protein, but I'd say my top two would be the hemp protein. Not everybody's a fan of it because it does have a really earthy flavor. My next second, like my my top one, I guess, would be the pumpkin seed protein. So it's just pumpkin seeds that have been ground up and the protein has been concentrated. There's nothing else added. So the hemp and the pumpkin themselves, there's no stevia, there's nothing else there. So people do really well. And the pumpkin seed protein can be hidden in smoothies that, you know, kids don't even know it's there if we add it to Stuart's oatmeal he doesn't know it's there and then some people do like the sprouted um, like the brown rice protein or different sprouted um, vegan sources of protein so those can be easier on the digestive system too but it's always good to have like a rotation right you don't want to be having the same thing every day maybe you'll do a month of hemp protein a month of pumpkin seed and a month of the sprouted protein so just mixing it up just gives you some different nutrient profiles or amino acids profiles. Interesting. What about like soy protein or pea protein? What do you think about those? Yeah. So if the pea protein is sprouted, it is easier on your system. I do see a lot of people with a food sensitivity to pea. So, you know, it's good to get some food sensitivity testing done to be sure it's okay. Cause some people will actually find they get headaches with pea protein or digestive upset. Um, in terms of the soy, you know, we are very careful about too much soy, right? And if we're doing soy, we want to get non GMO organic cause it is the most modified them like pretty heavily sprayed with pesticides it does have estrogenic effects so I would say I would opt to more get the other types of protein for sources of soy we typically do better with miso and tempeh so more of the fermented soys is easier on our system and if you get too much soy and not enough iodine then it's going to slow your thyroid so you got to be careful about that too. So soy is not my favorite, but if people were choosing soy, do more of the tempeh source or the miso source to make miso soup. Hmm, good to know. And actually, you just kind of talked about thyroid. Is there anything else you wanted to add about thyroid? Yeah, so I think it's like the hypothyroidism is definitely a huge issue that a lot of people are under like they're not diagnosed with and they have it. So And do you want to define what hypothyroidism is first? Totally. So hypothyroidism is when your thyroid, so you have the gland in your neck here, when it's underactive. So when it's underactive, so the thyroid governs our temperature, our metabolism. We have thyroid receptors all over our body. So the hormone has an effect on so many processes but if your thyroid's under functioning then you're going to be really fatigued you might suffer from low mood or depression you might have high cholesterol you can have weight gain and you're like i don't know why this is happening because i'm doing everything else right um you can have dry skin dry hair breaking nails so it, it is a really big problem. And if you're doing everything right and you're not losing weight, it's probably your hormones that need to be tested. So you need to get a full thyroid, a full thyroid panel, like a blood test. So not only the TSH, but the actual thyroid hormones called T3 and T4. And then you should also get tested for antibodies to the thyroid. So if your immune system is attacking the thyroid, this can be an early sign that your thyroid is going to be out of whack within a few years and it's probably not working as well right now. So you want to get the full thyroid panel there. And then I think there's a lot of thyroid problems because we all went to, you know, we were told salt was bad. So we all went to like low sodium and we need some iodine in the right amount to make the proper thyroid hormones. And then we can also look at, you know, estrogen in the birth control pill, which, you know, has been a savior for a lot of women, but that can start to like any of the synthetic estrogens may slow the thyroid too, 
all of these toxins we're exposed to in our environment can slow the thyroid. So it's a huge problem. And you may be told your thyroid's normal, but the range for especially that TSH is so large. So in the naturopathic world, you want to optimize your health, not just wait till you fall off the cliff or fall out of that range. So, and it's also based on how you're feeling, right? How are you as an individual as opposed to just the lab result? So we look at it all together. Interesting. Any other questions out there from our audience? Fire away. Anything else you want to add, Lisa? Mm. Uh, I think I covered pretty much everything. I don't want to overwhelm people, but feel free to ask me some questions on my Dr. Lisa Weeks Facebook page. Was there anything that you feel I should cover, Devel, that we didn't talk about? Oh, uh, there was one thing actually about the sleeping, actually. And so the question was, is that, okay, so we know six hours of sleep, not great. It'll lead to snacking the next day. Does that mean that if I sleep 10 hours, then, oh my God, I'm going to be perfect and not snack? Like, what's the range there. Yeah, yeah, the sweet spot's usually about seven to eight hours. And you know, you've gotten enough sleep. Ideally, you wake up right before your alarm goes off and you feel rested. And it's been a bit longer than the six hours too. So 10 hours, like when people get 10 hours, that can be a sign there might be, you know, depression or maybe a thyroid problem, their sleep's not that restorative. So they actually need to get a lot more. So that could be a warning sign too. And it may actually not serve you either. But yeah, if you're definitely if you are getting less sleep, you can feel tired in the afternoon and most people then crave sugar or carbohydrates because that's the quickest source of energy so it also impacts your choices the next day and they're typically less healthy because you just need something to keep you going interesting um can you talk a little bit about flaxseed does flaxseed have estrogen in it So flaxseed is considered phytoestrogen, but it's considered a good estrogen. So it can kick off the bad estrogens we're exposed to or the bad estrogens our body makes. So we metabolize estrogen into three forms. Um, I won't get into it too much, but the 2-hydroxy is really beneficial. So when we have flaxseed, so you want to ground it up. You don't want to eat the whole flaxseed because you can't digest that, but grind it up. Um, You're getting in phytoestrogens that are protective against the bad estrogens in the environment, the xenoestrogens from plastics and toxins or body care products, and also preventing, you know, if you're if you're the type of person to make a lot of more harmful estrogens that potentially can damage DNA, although the brassica vegetables are really good for that too, like cauliflower, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, etc., because they contain substances, what's called like DIM and indole-3-carbonyl, that also help us metabolize estrogens in a favorable way so that we're getting the most benefit. But flax seeds are great. So I know Jane talked about this too, but great to add to smoothies. If you're having yogurt, if you're having oatmeal, um, getting in a tablespoon or two per day is really good also for digestion as well and hormones. Does it help you metabolize faster? Is that why taking ground flaxseed is a good thing to do on a daily basis? What does it sort of help you do? Yeah, so it's really good for like the lignans and the fiber. So good for regularity. Those phytoestrogens are really good. So a lot of people have what's called estrogen dominance. So if you have an estrogen dominance, you can have a slower thyroid and slower metabolism. So if we clear or work on detoxifying the bad or excess types of estrogen, then your metabolism may improve. So it's not like a direct link, but estrogen dominance, people can have a harder time losing weight for sure. And then they might have more fibro endometriosis that sort of a thing so and then there's typically like liver herbs to help in those cases as well and then assessing the thyroid function itself Mm, interesting you know one thing we haven't really spoken a lot about is caffeine Mm -hmm. talk to us a little bit about caffeine and maybe sort of the differences in having that with coffee or a can of coke or green tea maybe Sure. Yeah, no, that's a really good question because a lot of people's caffeine intake is going up. So caffeine can be good for us and coffee can be good for us because there's a lot of antioxidants. So especially if you're grinding it up fresh every day, but you want to have it in moderation because it is a stimulant, right? So and some people are slow metabolizers of caffeine and some are um, fast metabolizers fast metabolizers. So I'm a slow metabolizer. So I can't have any caffeine after 12 after lunch, or else it's going to impact my sleep. I love the taste of coffee. But if I have coffee, I'll do like an organic decaf Swiss water decaf coffee, um, occasionally, but I really like to have tea, I have a green tea and a black tea every day. So coffee is basically like a sledgehammer. It's like, man, here's your energy 
go. You're like the Energizer Bunny, but then you might crash later because it's kind of emptying your gas tank. You're probably doing a lot more than you would do without the coffee, right? Whereas you, <laughs> if you look at tea, it's kind of like a nudge, like a little slow burn. So tea has usually about 40% of the caffeine that coffee does, depends on how you steep it, etc. And then tea also has L-theanine in it, which is a calming, relaxing amino acid. So tea from green, black, or white tea, because they're all from the same plant. Those kinds of teas have L-theanine. So that is counteractive to the caffeine in a good way. So the caffeine gives you a bit of a boost. The theanine chills you out, but gets you into a cool brainwave pattern where you can focus and concentrate better. Whereas for me, if I have like a caffeinated coffee, I'm buzzing up here, but my brain's like out of my body. So I can't even focus, <laughs> right? But tea is, is good for me. And then, you know, soda and Coke, you know, we look at the high fructose corn syrup, or if you're looking at Diet Coke, we look at the artificial sweeteners in there. Um, so it's like a double whammy. So the sugar is going to, you know, you're going to get a boost from the sugar and the caffeine. The sugar is going to crack. Like if the sugar levels are going to drop, you're going to release cortisol because you have low blood sugar. So it's an even worse roller coaster ride than the caffeine. <laughs> And then the artificial sweeteners, we're realizing if you have those, like people think it's a weight loss strategy, but your body's like thinking it's getting sugar, but it's not. So you can actually crave more sugar later and eat more. So they've been shown if you drink a lot of Diet Coke or soda, that you actually can gain more weight than if you didn't have it. So, Wow, that's crazy. We've got another question in the chat about goji berries. Do you want to talk okay. about what about goji berries? Sure. Yeah, goji berries are really great. They're really high in vitamin C, so that can help your immune system. They're not too high in sugar. They're really small. They're little like red. They're not even really shaped like a berry, but they're really chewy, so they can get stuck in your teeth. So, you know, you got to be careful with that. But they're, you know, in addition, you could mix a few with some of your nuts and seeds and have that as a little healthy snack, or some people will put them on their salads. But just be careful, you know, you're okay with chewing them or you don't have any swallowing issues because they are a bit harder to kind of break down, but they do have a lot of antioxidants too. So it's good to add in these different kind of foods just to give you some different nutrients. Right. That's awesome. That's great. Well, I think we're almost done. Do you want to let us know uh, how, how people can reach you and where they can contact you? And Definitely. Yeah. So I have a credit where your blog is and your podcast. Sure. Yes. Yeah. So my website's uh, www.drlisaweeks, D-R-Lisaweeks, W-E-E-E. W E E K S dot com and I have a free meal plan there. It's a detox meal plan. So if you sign up for my mailing list, you get that. You can follow me on Instagram at Dr. Lisa Weeks N D, as well as on Facebook, Dr. Lisa Weeks, Naturopathic Doctor. And then my um, podcast is called Perimenopausal Mamas.com. So that's Perry Menopause, no E with A L mamas m-a-m-a-s dot com so we've been recording since january you don't have to have hormonal issues because the last i think five have been related to what's going on now for example how to not gain weight during stressful times like a pandemic we had a relationship expert allison vila on the episode came out today so how to keep your relationship strong when stress levels are high um, and we actually interviewed someone who had covid19 in alberta so you can get what her experience was like there um, um, but listen in and tell all your uh, friends about the podcast as well if you think they could benefit. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today. I learned so much, Lisa. Oh, I'm going to go get some olives right now. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy your glass of wine tonight and some olives. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I love it. Exactly. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me. No and, problem. Uh, stay safe, everybody. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks a lot, Lisa. Okay. Bye. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Bye.